The Rock. You know the name. He is one of the most popular superstars in all of entertainment. And obviously, he got his start in the WWE. But his run in the WWE was a lot shorter than a lot of us remember it being. If you started watching, say, in 2015, you've already been a fan longer than his entire first time run as a full-time star in WWE. If you started watching during the pandemic era, hell, you're probably a fan longer than the entirety of the Attitude Era that people are still talking about decades later. But how short was The Rock's career, and how did he make a big enough impact in such a small window to be considered one of the greatest of all time, if not the biggest transcendent star out of pro wrestling and in to Hollywood. We'll go back. We'll go all the way back. If you smell what we're cooking, see what I did there? Dwayne Johnson was raised in the professional wrestling business, with his father, Rocky Johnson, being one half of the first African-American WWE World Tag Team Champions, and his mother, Anta Maivia, being the daughter of High Chief Peter Maivia, one of the greatest Polynesian pro wrestlers of all time. That isn't to say that The Rock's path to the WWE was an easy one. He battled with depression, a failed football career, and his family was also dealing with challenges of their own. All things he had to face as he was starting his path in professional wrestling, famously stating that he had seven bucks in his pocket, the name of his now very influential production company. But a name still opens doors, and it opened one for Johnson with Pat Patterson one of the most powerful men in pro wrestling at the time, and the famed first WWE Intercontinental Champion, who in 96 secured several tryout matches for him before he started a training tenure with USWA, the territory ran by Jerry the King Lawler. The Rock's first major test in front of WWE television cameras would come in a major arena, the world's most famous arena. Madison Square Garden in New York City at WWE Survivor Series 1996, where he would tag up with The Stalker, Mark Miro, and Jake Roberts to take on Crush, Goldust, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, and Jerry Lawler. WWE was rolling out the red carpet for this fresh-faced superstar, with Vince McMahon, Jim Ross, and Sonny singing his praises as he became the sole survivor for his team. Talk about a big way to be introduced to the masses. But as you know, the success for him did not come immediately. Just because WWE officials were behind this hot prospect, doesn't mean that fans took to him. Even with the prestigious Intercontinental title around his waist, The Rock, at one point in early part of his career in 97, had fans outright rejecting Rocky Maivia, as he was known then, probably because he was relatively bland and lacked a presentation of a rising star who the fans could sink their teeth into. But WWE officials were patient, and an unfortunate injury may have given him more time to recollect himself and reintroduce himself as the superstar he really wanted to become. And it truly worked. He came back as a more resentful version of himself. Rocky Maivia was gone. Now it was The Rock. This early version of this braggadocious character with this group would be one that would really become something else. Though the run of the Nation of Domination was short, it was impactful, lasting a little over a year. In that time, he first crossed paths with Stone Cold Steve Austin, losing to him in late 97. They had a rivalry then with Ken Shamrock, who leapt over to the WWE ranks from MMA, and the two going back and forth all the way up until WrestleMania 14, when WWE started to take a lead over its big multi-billion dollar rival, WCW. Around this time is when WWE really began testing the waters for rock in the main event scene. One example of this was him being the runner-up to Stone Cold Steve Austin in the 1998 Royal Rumble, where Stone Cold would go on to win the whole shebang at WrestleMania 14. It was clear that The Rock was outgrowing the nation, and while he had technically crossed paths with Triple H in the past, they were now both at a convergence. The names Rocky Maivia and Hunter Hearst Helmsley were things of the past. Their real storied rivalry got going in mid-1998, when The Rock led the nation against the now feuding and revived D-Generation X, led by Triple H. I actually caught a big multi-man Nation vs. DX match at the Rosemont Horizon in suburban Chicago in 98, and it was one of my favorite matches I saw as a teenager. 
But this was all about The Rock and the game, the two of them racing to see who would be the next big superstar in WWE. With The Rock gaining an edge over the game at the King of the Ring tournament and then retaining the IC title due to a time limit running out in a two out of three falls match before the game finally got the better of him at SummerSlam in a ladder match. Although Triple H told The Rock that he remembers kicking his ass for the most part during their rivalry, technically, the Great One has the edge with a 12 and nine win loss record against the game, which is a narrow enough margin for ass whooping. It may have taken Triple H a while to get all those wins back, but that's a subject for an entire different video. Yeah, by the way, uh, Triple H won something else, you know, running the entire storylines of WWE. Did he really lose? Did he lose? Huh? Do you smell that? As for The Rock himself, even the crowd that he was insulting on a weekly basis began to realize that he was really good at this. Much like Ric Flair before him, you become so bad that the crowd likes you being so badass. It set wheels in motion for an organic face turn, featuring him feuding against his fellow nation stablemates and D-Lo, Mark Henry, to push an end to the nation for good. Farouk was long out of the group for a while now, but this was just a twist on top of a bigger twist to come. Heading into Survivor Series with the Deadly Games Tournament in 98, there was a lot of drama surrounding the WWE Championship. Mr. McMahon was at his wit's end trying to screw Stone Cold over and over again, and Kane and The Undertaker were somehow managed to fall into the entire messy scene. After failing to protect Mr. McMahon from Stone Cold, the title became vacant and culminated in a 14-man tournament at Survivor Series to determine the new champion. Hardcore wrestling icon Mankind, Mick Foley, was positioned as the new corporate favorite heading into the tournament, while The Rock was rapidly rising as a hot star who was getting real fan support. Thankfully, people only remembered the end of the tournament because the other matches were frankly uh, not that memorable, except for the one with Stone Cold losing to Mankind. Yeah, but the ending of the whole thing made it worth wild, with The Rock somehow becoming the corporate champion? Yeah, and the corporation of Mr. McMahon screwing over mankind who this Survivor Series swerve a Rooney served up by WWE served two purposes. It allowed The Rock to be double hated now, just as he was getting that fan support, and mankind to be fully embraced by the WWE audience as an easy to invest in underdog. As the face of the corporation, The Rock began a legendary feud with Mick Foley. Yeah, they're still calling him Mankind. And this led to incredible matches on major pay-per-views and the rivalry being a real one that would help separate Money at Raw from WCW Nitro in the ratings. It would get going with a big title change in a no DQ match that aired on Monday Night Raw, seeing Mankind get the title from Rocky with the help of Stone Cold Steve Austin, D-Generation X, interference from the corporation. It was a wild scene, but Mrs. Foley's baby boy came away with the strap. The Royal Rumble in 1999 would see The Rock take on Mankind in an incredibly violent match, maybe one of the most violent matches we've seen in WWE since the Hell in a Cell. Yeah, you remember that one. With assistance from the corporation Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon, The Rock would cheat McFoley out of the title. McFoley never said the words, I quit in that match. They used a recording of him and held a microphone to his mouth as if he said it. Later that same month, The Rock and Mankind would take over the halftime of the Super Bowl with halftime heat airing against the halftime show of the Super Bowl football game that year. This cinematic style match saw Rock and Mankind battle through an empty arena. Foley had to use a forklift to pin The Rock, yeah. He can raise his eyebrow, but not his shoulders. Rock and Foley would battle to a stalemate at St. Valentine's Day Massacre in a last man standing match. With the help of The Big Show, The Rock would finally regain the title heading into WrestleMania from Mankind on Monday Night Raw. The Rock, though, was ready for something bigger than just being the WWE Champion. What could that be? What was this absolutely grizzled saga that he survived with Foley gonna get him to? The main event of WrestleMania, with the rival that would define his career in the highest echelons of WWE legends, Stone Cold Steve Austin. 
the Brahma Bull would face the Texas Rattlesnake, who challenged him for his championship and took it from him in their first of epic WrestleMania main events at WrestleMania 15. This would soon follow a Backlash rematch, where at this point, the fans were smelling what The Rock was cooking, and they wanted him to be someone the fans could cheer once again. The corporation faction turned on Rocky, and he truly shot to mega stardom, becoming the star that he was always destined to be, the people's champion. That couldn't have been more perfectly encapsulated when just a few days later, WWE premiered SmackDown, a show named after one of The Rock's catchphrases. Who else can say that they've done that? The Rock continued his revenge tour against the corporation or the corporate ministry, unsuccessfully chasing after The Undertaker for the world title at King of the Ring, and having to deal with the big boss man along the way too. And he had to deal with a brief challenge from Mr. Ass himself, Billy Gunn, in a Kiss My Ass match at SummerSlam 99. Yes, that is something that happened. Though The Rock was chasing gold, he would find something else along the way. There were millions and millions of Rock's fans, but The Rock needed a friend. The iconic Rock and Sock connection was formed. Yes, The Rock with Mick Foley, leading to some of the greatest and most hilarious segments in the history of WWE television. And the most famous This Is Your Life segment, which went down to become one of the highest rated individual segments in the history of WWE. The odd pairing of a disheveled, leather-faced Mick Foley who could win the fans over with a joke and brutalizing his body and The Rock's otherworldly charisma and snappy catchphrases made them something special just to watch on screen together, let alone have matches together as a team. Apart from the comedy, they enjoyed three different reigns together as WWE Tag Team Champions. Heading into the year 2000, Stone Cold was out of action due to an injury he suffered at an angle that played out with a hit and run car accident. But Stone Cold legitimately needed to heal up, but this allowed The Rock to become WWE's undisputed number one star at the time. This also led to him in his second successive WrestleMania main event in 2000, which was uh, unfortunately forgettable, a four-way match with the McMahons in every corner. Though WWE was rolling in money and success at the time with The Rock as one of their biggest names, they opted not to go with him becoming the new champion at WrestleMania that year. No, they, they went with the bad guy, Triple H. It was an odd choice in retrospect. The Rock's desire to get revenge over McMahon, who turned on him, ended up becoming something that would get him even more than just revenge, but the WWE Championship for the first time in over a year at Backlash after Stone Cold returned to help him do it. Once two young lions in WWE's rising pack years earlier, they were now at the top. The Rock had a new challenge from someone he was familiar with, Triple H and it was going to get personal and become one of the biggest feuds of that year. They went back and forth four times in four months, with Triple H regaining the WWE Championship only three weeks after losing it. This time it came in the form of a memorable Iron Man match, with Triple H only won because The Undertaker attacked him with just five seconds left on the clock, technically making it a day Q to score the win for the game. It may sound like the typical screwy finish, but the crowd reaction was out of this world. A commonplace during The Rock's peak, and a commonplace during the Attitude Era. Triple H technically won three out of the four battles there, and snuck away with the title. The Rock eventually walked out with the WWE Championship after pinning Mr. McMahon in a six-man tag team match. Wait, 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 what, 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 yeah, okay, okay. King of the Ring that year, The Rock teamed up with Kane and The Undertaker against Triple H, Shane McMahon, and Mr. McMahon. The stipulation stated that regardless of who got pinned, they would become the WWE Champion. Uh, why? Vince McMahon fumbled when he tried to hit the people's elbow on The Rock, you know, because I don't think he's that coordinated, and ate the pin instead to give him the WWE title win. Kurt Angle won the King of the Ring tournament that same night and began his pursuit of the championship. While he first lost at SummerSlam in a match also involving Triple H, his luck quickly changed. It was at no mercy when The Rock lost the title to Kurt Angle in a classic underrated match. 
ending his title reign at little less than four months. This was a match where Rock truly elevated Angle to another level. With the title loss, it was a very underrated match that you can watch in full here on YouTube on WWE's official YouTube channel. Oh, you didn't agree that it was good? Well, internet wrestling purists, it got 4.2 stars out of 5 from Big Papa Dave Meltzer at the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. So there. It was around this time that Rikishi infamously declared that he was the man. He was the culprit who ran down Stone Cold with his car some months earlier, doing it all for The Rock. Yeah, that's the way he said it. The Rock had no part in it and even made fun of Rikishi and the way he delivered that dialogue. I did it for The Rock. But it was exactly the move to seemingly push Rikishi into the main event scene, even though he was a hot mid Carter. Pretty bizarre choice, indeed. The Rock refused to be away from the WWE Championship and pursued it again, but failed before oddly becoming a WWE Tag Team Champion with The Undertaker. Yeah, what an odd pairing. They literally just put those two top guys together. He eventually won the WWE Championship back from Kurt Angle at No Way Out in early 2001, setting the stage for a rematch against Stone Cold Steve Austin in the main event of WrestleMania. In his third consecutive WrestleMania main event, the second against Stone Cold, he lost again. But this time, it was thanks to the shocking interference of Mr. McMahon, who finally aligned himself with his longtime rival, Stone Cold. Yeah, it was pretty confusing, and the crowd in Houston, who was red hot for the match, was still kind of shaking their heads. Make no mistake about it, WrestleMania 17 is still considered one of the greatest wrestling pay-per-views of all time, but it's just the direction that things took after that main event that was kind of lackluster to say the least. No shot at The Rock, just the choices that were made in the eyes of some fans. Thankfully, those bad decisions didn't really affect The Rock. Yeah, he shook it off with all of his electricity and stepped away from wrestling for a few months to begin his journey into Hollywood with a featured role in The Scorpion King. He missed a good chunk of the invasion angle, which again was probably for his own good since that didn't really hit, right? Yeah. That didn't stop him from becoming a focal point of the story upon his return when he became the WCW champion by beating Booker T at SummerSlam. He would eventually lose that title to a WCW veteran who is now in the WWE ranks, Chris Jericho. Yeah, just a couple months later, and a night after that, he was paired up with him to become tag team champions. Once again, one of those odd pairings. And who did they lose to? The duo of Booker T and Test. They really were just pairing up anyone back then. He regained the WCW title from Jericho and led the Team WWE in victory over Team Alliance to put the rest of that rather bad invasion storyline to bed. Though Rock's eyebrows still remained raised, the curtain for him was starting to close in his time in his first full-time run in WWE. Not long after Survivor Series came was Vengeance in the famous night that Chris Jericho will never let anyone forget because he defeated The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin in the same night to unify the WWE and WCW world titles. Though the invasion angle of WCW and ECW and WWE never really clicked, as 2002 got going, there was a real collision between The Rock, one of the biggest stars in WWE, against one of the biggest factions to come over from WCW, the NWO. This meant we could get that big match, the Icon versus Icon. WrestleMania 18, The Rock versus Hulk Hogan. The match sells the show itself. Although the main event in Toronto that year was indeed Triple H versus Chris Jericho, the real main event was Hogan Rock. The reactions to this match are absolutely berserk. It was incredible, despite Hogan being the heel in the black and white, he was getting that nostalgic red and yellow energy brother from 68,000 fans. The reaction you could see was absolute magic. The Rock had to change the entire psychology of the match on the fly to make it work. And although he defeated Hogan in an oddly timed passing of the torch match, it remains one of the greatest moments in WrestleMania history and it was enough to turn Hogan back into a beloved hero in the eyes of WWE fans. Rock was the number one pick overall in the first WWE draft between Raw and SmackDown in 02, getting moved over to SmackDown, but he ended up taking another one of those hiatuses instead and came back to immediately challenge and regain the WWE title for one last time during this run. His WWE title win here, though, was not about him having the title, but rather who would take it from him. The new kid on the block the next big thing, Brock Lesnar. Lesnar was living up to the hype and being pushed harder than anyone out of WWE's developmental system in his rookie year, just four months after his debut on the main roster, 
wrecking everyone in sight, he headlined SummerSlam and defeated The Rock to become the WWE Champion, one of the youngest WWE Champions at that time. As for The Rock, this was again near the end of him in his first full-time run in WWE. He returned for a bit in 2003, debuted the heelish Hollywood Rock persona, did those hilarious Rock concert promos where he went off on the crowd, and was just a really entertaining villain that fans enjoyed booing him. Yes, he was still entertaining, but he was the bad guy. It probably had to do with his experience accumulated by then, but the only downside of this was the run was extremely short-lived. There was still a bit of resentment from fans for him quote-unquote leaving, even though he came back and was seen as someone who sold out a sentiment that grew over the next few years, especially from WWE fans that followed him into his movie career, but he wasn't calling himself The Rock in his movies, he was Dwayne Johnson. But that was still a few years away. In the world of WWE, the world that made him a megastar, he quickly proved why he was still considered one of the greats. The music, the presentation, his demeanor, a lot of it changed, but it still maintained the core elements of what made him such a great character. This would essentially be the beginning of the end for him as he went on an unofficial farewell tour against a series of legends. The big one though coming up for The Rock was the final showdown with Stone Cold Steve Austin in Seattle at WrestleMania 19, a match that would end the active in-ring career of Stone Cold Steve Austin and one that was highly emotional for both men. At one point, at the end of the match, with Rock picking up the win, he would express some very private words of gratitude to Stone Cold in the ring. The Rock concerts wouldn't continue on for much longer since we saw the introduction into WWE of Goldberg. Yes, even he managed to get himself cheered a bit over the newcomer in the process. And for all those saying that Rock sold out the WWE, here he was putting over a big new star in the WWE with Goldberg. Like with the cycle in 1998 and 1999, he simply became too good to hate, and his lack of appearances made the value of him appearing more special when he did appear. The Rock would come back to team with Mick Foley one more time, a Rock and Sock Connection reunion in MSG at WrestleMania 20 to take on three of the four members of Evolution and Randy Orton, Ric Flair, and Batista, but they wouldn't come up on the side of that match. This was the Great One's final match in WWE for over seven years. But you can't deny the box office of the highest selling WWE pay-per-view of all time around that time in WrestleMania 28. I was there. It's awesome. We'll cover that in the future. All in, his full-time run in WWE lasted just shy of 16 years. An additional couple of years as a feature player. We mentioned the words short but impactful earlier, but come on, The Rock truly has carved out his space even in that short time as one of the all-time greats in professional wrestling and undeniably the most transcendent star that wrestling has ever made for mainstream entertainment. Like we said, there's nobody bigger ever coming out of the WWE besides him. Maybe it's someone we haven't seen yet. Fans have been a lot kinder to him thanks to the benefit of hindsight, and if there's anything you should be grateful for, it's the fact that The Rock doesn't hide his WWE past. It's a huge part of who he is and what he does today. Some of those wrestling purists like to say that they don't like The Rock's in-ring wrestling ability. But, as The Rock would say, it doesn't matter what they think. He was so charismatic and truly connected with audiences across the world during the peak of WWE and a time when WWE defeated its biggest rival. If you like this video and you smell la 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 what we're cooking, go ahead and hit the like button. Tell us your favorite Rock memories and moments, maybe even some of your favorite quotes of The Rock in the comments below. And watch more wrestling videos from Sports Key to Wrestling.